A little under 10 minutes for questions. We're trying to get people out a few minutes ahead of schedule so you have time to go to the, the next sessions, which start at 3. So I'll open it to the floor. Questions for either Michelle or Catherine. The mic's going around. Hi, Michelle. Um, a question about um, what looks like a fabulous project in Australia, but um, how much does it cost and who funded it? Okay. Sorry, I was afraid that would be the downer. Yeah, yeah. There's always, it's, is this on if I lean over? Sorry. Yeah, it's, it really is all about the funding and where it comes from. Um, the CARM1 repository got the majority of its funding from the members who had decided they wanted to be part of this shared collection idea. So they would have um, contributed funds up front for that, for the development of CARM1 repository. Um, some of the funding did come from the Australian government and from the state library, or the, the Victorian state universe, uh, <coughs> excuse me, government. Um, because at that time, um, the State Library of Victoria was in desperate need of some storage facilities as well for their newspaper collection, I believe it was. They had several kilometres of material that needed to be stored. So um, the um, state government chipped in as well. So um, the State Library were able to use the facility for their newspapers. It was never part of the shared collection but it was a safe and secure and environmentally controlled environment for their collection to rest in for a number of years. Now, they have since moved to their own purpose-built storage facility in Ballarat, which is a little further out from Melbourne again. Um, in terms of the figure for that, I actually don't have that sort of information as to how much each member would have contributed up front. But certainly when you saw the pieces of the pie, that would be really indicative of how much, in, in a, relatively speaking, each member would have contributed. So their allocation within the CARM1 repository and in the shared collection would have been based on the upfront contribution they would have made. And they would have decided that in advance and obviously decided, well, we, this is as much as we would need, therefore we will contribute X amount. Now, I don't actually have those particular figures at all, I'm afraid. Um, CARM2, on the other hand, was less of a collaboration insofar as there are much fewer members decided to go down that road of um, investing up front in CARM2. Only three of the members decided that this is what they wanted to do. And they decided to do that not with a view to continually or continuously contributing to the shared collection, but they really wanted um, storage for their own collections. They didn't want to cede ownership of them. They were running out of space. And they realised that um, Caval could provide an excellent service to them for um, service provision for um, interlibrary loans and document delivery services. So whatever they did send out to us, um, they would easily be able to access without any delays, uh, with a prompt turnaround for requests, both hard copy and electronic. So um, there, I suppose they were drifting away from the shared collection idea when they were thinking of CARM2. And there were some figures up on the board there which will be available obviously in the presentation when it goes online, which gives you an idea of the sort of sum of money. I think um, CARM2 was about $15 million to build. Um, and Monash University, Melbourne University and RMIT would have contributed fairly equal share to that, or MIT a little less because they have less of an allocation in there. And Caval also contributed funding to that as well because Caval has an allocated space within that facility also. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid it's a bit light on the actual dollar figure, but uh, it's not inexpensive, uh, I suppose. But um, and, and the more places you can get your draw your funds from, I suppose, the better. But um, an interesting note was that when CARM2 was being planned, and they were getting the pricing for all the, the steel shelving. There, was a, ha, there had been a huge boom in China, and they, there was a huge draw on steel heading to China, so the price of steel was astronomical. Then there was a slight downturn in China, and um, as a result of a delay in the planning process for CARM2, we managed to save over $2 million on the price of the shelving alone when the price of steel dropped. So that was good fortune. But uh, yeah, as I say, more specific than that, I don't have that information. But you know, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I could maybe put you in touch with someone who could give you that information. Another question over here. Thank you. 
Okay, that was wonderful. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. I just want to ask you about where there are co collection, collecting initiatives done by kind of commercial, you know, the man on the bridge or local histories. What is the unique um, quality of libraries becoming involved in this space? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. Part of the motivation uh, from what we saw when people came into us is that often you're talking about someone who has had material in their possession, who feels that they are the guardian, and who is afraid that a next generation or whoever it passes to won't attach the same significance to it. And I think where they see the role, particularly for libraries and archives, is about long-term preservation. So that they feel they're participating in something where there's a longer-term commitment, and of course, the longer term commitment, both in terms of creating metadata, cataloguing, storing the material, is significant for libraries. Um, but that is the business that traditionally we've been in. And I, I think that that's probably the very particular role. Um, it's also the case as well that where these kinds of processes work well, libraries have excellent networks of trust. So we have relationships that are pre-existing and that are built, and where the process is very much anchored in being about public good. Um, and I think those things are drivers for people too. Okay, we've got time for one quick question and a quick answer. Monica. Thank you. Um, it's back to Michelle again. I'm just wondering about the, you mentioned that the, the philosophy was that if something was in CARM that the libraries should discard, all the other libraries should discard yeah. other copies, that it should be single. But how do the libraries know when something gets seeded into CARM? Um, well, they can check uh, their, their holdings against Libraries Australia because we also contribute our holdings to Libraries Australia. So once they see that there's a holding there, they can be confident that the copy they have is no longer, well, they can do with it what they will, really. Um, obviously, discard is probably the way most people would go, um, but it's very much dependent on what they want to do with it. But yeah, because our holdings are uh, religiously added, I think that every couple of weeks or so, um, Libraries Australia is updated with our holdings, so our member libraries should know exactly what we've got and match, do a cross-reference, I suppose, between the, what they have and what we have, and then eliminate from their collections what we hold. Thank you. I'm going to ask for your appreciation again for <laughs> Michelle and Catherine. <laughs> and that concludes this session. Thank you. No,